Washington uh, called me and asked me to speak to you today. He asked me to speak about the book about my father, actually, um, that was published last year. But as we were talking recently, he also asked me to share with you some lessons that I've learned about being in the battle. And it occurred to me as I was sitting here this morning that Marla could teach those lessons because she's walked that walk. <laughs> we don't all have a battle. This is evident as Marla has. But we all walk in a spiritual battle. My dad walked in a spiritual battle. He was in World War II, yes. But he also had the other war, the spiritual war. So let me just unpack that a little bit. Do you ever think to yourself, gosh, life is really messy, and that sometimes it's difficult, and there's no easy answers. Where is God in all of this mess? I prayed and prayed, but I just don't hear him, and I don't see him. I don't feel him. And we all like to think that life as a Christian is all tied up in neat, nice, neat little packages and bows. That there's an easy answer for everything else we do is have to flip open to the Bible and you're going to find it. And that those warm and fuzzy feelings that we have when we're here, right here in chapel, is just going to carry us through the day. But as Christian leaders, as Christian leaders, you'll be facing challenges you never thought you would face. Just like you you may not be in a place where there's actual bullets whizzing across your head in the foxhole like my dad was. But we are all in that of some sorts. Sometimes in this physical world, but sometimes in the spiritual world as well, and sometimes both. So if you're not in one right now, there's probably a good chance that you've just come out of one or that you're just going into one. Now why do I say that? Because the Bible tells us that's the way it's going to be. Because when you're in a battle in this physical world, that's when Satan wants to take pot shots at you and enter in a spiritual battle with you. And because as you as Christian leaders, we have a target on our back. Because when you're making a difference for God in the world, the enemy has you as a target. So, what are a few things that we need to do when we are in the middle of our battle let me offer a few practical suggestions. I'm an attorney, so I always come up with my to-do list. So, the Bible has a great list of seven. I come up with seven things. Keep in mind when we have in our middle of our spiritual battles. The first thing is when the seas are stormy, get in the boat and hang on to the mast. Hang on to the master. I recently heard a woman pastor, yes, I said that, a woman pastor, um, that was speaking and she told me she grew up on the uh, west shore of Scotland. And she said the North Seas are sometimes so stormy that they can't take a boat across from Scotland to Ireland. But the times that it was stormy and she was still able to get the last boat out, the captain would say, hurry up, dear, come on in and tie yourself to something on the boat. She would tie herself, tie herself to the mast. And I think when we're in a storm, when nothing else is is like we thought it was, when everything is, is like we never thought it would be, we tie ourselves to the master. Second, don't pray that the trials will go away. Pray for boldness in the trial. <coughs> Joshua 1.9, one of my favorite verses, it is on my wall in my bathroom on the mirror. It says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is on your side. Isn't that cool to look at every morning? I'll tell you, it gets me going when I get out in the morning. And Acts 4 9, when John and, and Paul were dragged before the Sanhedrin, what did they ask for? Did they ask for the Sanhedrin to just somehow go away? No. They didn't ask for the trials to disappear. They asked for boldness that God would give them the words when he spoke to the Sanhedrin. And Ephesians 6, 9, 6, 19, when Paul was sitting in some first century God-forsaken jail, what did he ask for? He asked that God would give him the words so he would speak boldly and fearlessly the gospel. So pray for boldness when you're in the trial. Third, know that. You just got to go in knowing some things. So know that all things work together for good. For those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. I knew this verse when I was in eighth grade. And I'll tell you, this is something that is underlined, dog tagged, highlighted in my Bible. And I would suggest that you all commit that to heart. 
And take a page from the playbook of Joseph, Genesis 53, 20. His brothers sold him into slavery and told his parents he was dead. Now talk about being uh, betrayed by someone that you trust. But when they came years later and he gave them grain, he said, what you meant for evil, God used for good. I'm not saying there isn't evil in the world. There is a lot of bad things. But what is out there that evil God can use for good. And fourth, know that God will be with you wherever you go. Psalm 139 is just a great psalm. I go to it all the time, whether I've had a good day or whether I've had kind of a rotten day. But it says, his right hand will guide us. No matter where we go, even there, he will be with us. Psalms are a great place, by the way, when you're in the midst of the battle. Because David was in the midst of so many battles. His very life is at stake. I can't even imagine being hunted down by someone who used to love me. But he cried out to God. And sometimes a great place of comfort you when you're in battle. Fifth, put on the armor of God. Put on God's armor. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 is a great place to be in your Bible when you're in the battle. And I guarantee you, Marla has put on her armor just by talking to her. So let's unpack this passage a little bit. Paul tells us when we're in a spiritual battle, Put on God's armor so that when, not if, when the day of evil comes, you will stand your ground, you will fight the fight, and you'll stand. So, what does he say first? Stand and be firm and be bold. Don't be wishy-washy. Be bold. He talks about putting the belt of truth around your waist. The truth is going to come out eventually anyway. So be on the right side of truth. Don't be on the side of lying or making iffy things or, you know, having to backpedal. It's going to come out and felt protect your guts. And sometimes your guts, when you're in a spiritual battle, are in your throat because of you're so nauseous and sick of the whole thing. And so the belt of truth will protect your guts. He talks about the breastplate of righteousness. You know, that's the modern day flag jacket. Oh, sorry. Yikes. <laughs> the modern day flag jacket. You know, it, can, it protects your heart. It protects all your vital organs. So be on the side of right, because that will guard your heart. So when you're in a spiritual battle, things go through your mind, and you don't want to be on the unrighteous side. He talks about footwear to spread the gospel of peace. Even in the midst of the battle, don't go looking for trouble. Don't go stirring up the pot when you don't have to. Don't, pick, don't make battles within battles when you don't have to. If you must disagree with someone, do it with self-control and be peaceful about it. So be in peace when you can, even if you're in the midst of a battle. He talks about using the shield of faith because Satan's attacking us with these fiery arrows. You know, they're bullets these days. So you're going to need every ounce of faith to ward off Satan and shield yourself. And then he talks about putting on the helmet of salvation. And why does he do that? Because Satan is attacking your mind in your thoughts. He's putting doubt in your mind, and those doubts are growing. And they grow into fear. And it's insidious. So the helmet of salvation, salvation of God, that God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you that you are infinite value to him. We need to focus on God and his love for us, not on our problems and not on our fears. So put on your helmet of salvation to stop the mind games that Satan loves to play with us. And then he says, take up your sword of the spirit. Now this is your only offensive weapon. You know, when, when Jesus was attacked by Satan and the Pharisees, how did he respond? Did he say, well, I think that so-and-so, or studies have shown so-and-so. No, he didn't do that. He's just like, it's not my opinion. It's not studies have shown opinion. This is God's word. He used the scripture as the standard by which he judged those accusing him. And we should do the same. Use your scripture. Know your scripture. That is where we hold ourselves and others accountable. So if someone asks you to try to cut corners or not 
follow through with an agreement. Use your scripture. You know what that says. God wants you to honor your agreements. Men and women, if you are with someone and you're trying to figure out if that person really loves you, use your scripture. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about love. There's a description right there. Love is patient and kind. It is not arrogant or selfish or rude. It doesn't anger. It doesn't demand its own way. It's not beautiful. It's not touchy. It's loyal. It always looks the best in others. It's loyal. It doesn't keep score. Men and women, if you're trying to figure out if that person that you're with loves you and this is going to last a lifetime, hold them up to scripture. Look at their accent to scripture. If you're trying to find if someone is really a Christian or not, well, all you have to do is look at Galatians 5. That's where the fruit of the Spirit is. Do they have the fruit of the Spirit evident in their lives? Do they have love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control and faithfulness? It'll be there if they have it in their lives. Use your scripture. And finally, Paul says, pray without ceasing. Prayer is our lifeline. Someone asked Mother Teresa, how do you deal with all the frustrations and the problems associated with this mission? And she said, the answer is quite simple. Right. Mother Teresa. I just And of all the people in the world, I'm sure that she was the target of saving service. She was always in prayer. So number six, why do we have battles in the first place? I'll tell you a couple things that came to mind. As I said, Satan is targeting people who are making a difference. They are targeting leaders. If you aren't doing anything, if you're on the sidelines, you are not a threat to him. He's going to leave you alone. If you're actually doing something, you've got a target. But it's also a fallen world. And sometimes we're in battles because of our own sin, which has consequences. And sometimes we're in battles because of other people's sin. And that has consequences too. But most importantly, number seven, is God going to accomplish in our battles. And I think it's going to accomplish two things. James 1, another part of my Bible, underlined, highlighted, stars to the side, little red notes. Our trials test our faith, which in turn develop perseverance, which in turn develop us Christians who are spiritually mature and complete. I, honestly, I don't like God's methods. I would rather go along in life with butterflies and puppies. But you know what? I cannot argue with the outcomes. Because our trials mature us and they equip us. Which brings me to the second thing that I think God accomplishes in our trials. 2 Corinthians 1 3 says, In our battles, God will comfort us so that, so that we can comfort others in their battles. Because we have gone through one of our battles and have emerged victorious, we are uniquely equipped to help others who are struggling in that same thing. And God has given us the assignment to do so. There's no one else that knows the struggles of cancer, like someone who's going through cancer. There is no one else who knows the struggles of someone who's going through a difficult relationship or a divorce, like someone who's been there. There's no one else that knows the struggles that someone faces in addiction, except for someone who's been there and won before. We are God's hands and feet here on earth. He doesn't have any hands but yours and mine. So how does all this relate to some World War II soldier whose daughter wrote a book about him called The Angels of Evelyn Well, it's a story about one ordinary soldier who was your age, at the time. He was in the midst of a physical battle and a spiritual battle. And he put on the armor of God and he came out victorious. First of all, that book captures the story. You know, just an ordinary World War II soldier who had the rare privilege of retracing his steps through Europe some 60 years after the war and reconnecting with lifelong friends who were forged, those friendships were forged in the fires of war. And he had the honor of surveying the lives and the nations whose lives he transformed, not only through his acts as a soldier, but through his acts of kindness <clears throat> as a person of faith. And second, it's a tribute to all the men and women who wear the uniform, who take up their nation's call and, and 
follow the duty to fight. And it's a duty to their courage, which is not the absence of fear, but it's forging ahead despite the fear. And finally, the book has a message for all of us to embrace. Because regardless of where we are, or how much education we have, or our status in life, even in all our ordinariness, each one of us can be a light in the darkness. And the darkness of battle that transforms another life, that heals another heart, that gives wings to an angel who has forgotten how to fly. And in so doing, when we reach out in kindness, we're not only changing ourselves, we're changing the world. So let me tell you a little bit about how this journey started. It started in 2003. You guys were little, little ones. I was, I was 40, so don't do the math there. <laughs> but I realized my life was half-lived at 40. And my parents were in their 80s, and they were at the end of their lives. And I wanted to know my dad better. Because like most World War II veterans and most people in battle, he didn't talk about the war, it was just too painful. And I wanted to know those formative years, those years 18 to 21, where you guys are right now. I wanted to know what happened to him during those years, the making of the man that I knew. So, hoping that he would open up a little bit more, we got to the other side of the pond, I invited him to retrace his footsteps through Europe on the 60th anniversary of D-Day. <coughs> So he accepted the invitation, and he was particularly happy about it because he knew this time in Europe he wouldn't have bullets whizzing by him. So he was very excited to accept that. So I turned the journal and a video camera, and I was just hoping, bless you, to, uh, to have a nice family vacation, but God had other plans. You see, we didn't realize that God had things that he needed to teach us, and God had a few people that we needed to meet, and we had a few people that needed to meet us. And so he arranged those meetings, and those are what I like to call divine appointments. What I realized, and what God had to teach me, is that my dad at 82, you know, was just a youngster inside. He was 22 in an 82 year old's body. But my dad had run his race, and he had done it well. And this, the sunset of his life, this was his victory lap. This was his final effort to to reach out and reconnect with lifelong friends, Germans and Belgians and French, that he had befriended when he was liberating their lands. And his life had come full circle, and he had to tell them that their trust in him had not been misplaced. And he went back to see that the lives that he had transformed through his acts of kindness were shown in the midst of the war, in the bloodiest battle, that the flame of faith and goodness still shone brightly. And what he didn't realize, what God taught my dad, was that they were so eternally grateful for what he had done. And so this old gentleman at 82 was able to hear from people whose lives transformed that his life it did had meaning and it was significant. And what he didn't realize that the German soldiers, just 18 and 20 year olds, just like him, they had longed to tell him their story now in 80 and 80 something years old. Why did they have to tell me a story? Because they had no choice but to fight for the Nazis because they and their families would have been slaughtered. And these old German soldiers stood in line for hours just to come up and meet my dad and tell him their story and ask forgiveness. They needed their hearts healed and my dad needed his hearts healed. And when I saw these 80 year old German soldiers and American soldiers hugging and forgiving realized that they were just doing their duties and neither one wanted to be there. That is something that, that was a divine appointment. God arranged to heal hearts on both sides. And my dad didn't realize that the younger active duty soldiers would come up to him and they would ask him something that everybody in combat struggles with. Why am I here? And my buddy next to me, my foxhole. My dad was able to give them the words of King David in Psalm 139. All our days were ordained for us before one of them came to be. The Lord called him home. So, another divine appointment to heal hearts that needed healing on both sides. So, when God asked what the most, or Jesus was asked what the most important commandment is, what did Jesus say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul. 
and love others as yourself. Jesus is about relationships. God is about relationships. Relationships with him and us. There's nothing else that we're going to take to heaven anymore. Nothing else is going to make it to heaven other than the relationships we take. And sometimes we think, gosh, I'm just an ordinary person. What can I do in this life? But we're on assignment on earth here. He tells us to love. And we can all do that. So my dad was in a battle, World War II, the bloodiest battle in the history of the world. But he was also in a spiritual battle. And he put on his armor, and he came out victorious. And their lives transformed. And I hope this book is a blessing and an inspiration for you and for others who are going through it. I have a book available back there. Haiti D'Angelo has been gracious enough to um, uh, to offer to, to be there and, and uh, I don't know, they're, I'm offering them at ten dollars. Those are just my cost. Um, anything profits that I make from the book are going to help the wounded warriors um, and the honor flights and Purple Heart homes. But I want to leave you with a message, men and women. We're in a physical battle here. In this world, we're in spirit. So hang on to the master. Tie yourself around him when everything else seems to be on you. That's what we're Thank you for having me.